Chris Hansen here. There's some sad news to report this holiday season, but perhaps you can help. The family of 39-year-old Bowman is pleading for information. Bowman, uh, missing you and praying for you, and the family has a reward if found. So uh, please share, okay? And uh, you know, you are a sweet, creative, and generous human being. Uh, the world could use a lot more of you. Okay. Some familiar faces trying to raise awareness to the disappearance of Bo Mann. Now, some faces you might not be familiar with are his friends and family who are desperately searching for answers and searching for Bo. They need help. It's time to turn on the searchlight for Bo Mann. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for joining me here today and caring about these cases like I do. Now, you might have heard Sarah Palin talk about creativity. What exactly was Bowman responsible for creating? We're going to start with that as we get into the details of his disappearance. Let's go ahead and pick it up at the New York Daily News. Sober Grid is an iPhone and Android application, and it has two big features. A Facebook-like news feed where users can ask questions and post content, and a grid that connects sober people by their location. If you've ever had anyone struggling with addiction in your family, um, taking the path to sobriety, you know that in particular, when they travel, They sometimes get to other locations and they still need support, but they don't have their home network anymore. Sober Grid was there to help with that. Users can mark their profiles with a blue box to indicate they need a ride to a support group. Picking a red box indicates crisis mode and the need to chat quickly with someone. The app facilitates texting between users who are in all stages of recovery. Certainly uh, an amazing application by the sounds of it, and what a wonderful tool for people to have as they're taking the path to sobriety. As a matter of fact, it was written up about at Forbes in man's own words about his experiences that led to this development of this application. A few years ago, I was away from home at the Sundance Film Festival, and I wanted to connect with other sober people for both social activities and supportive connection. This type of connection is especially important when one is away from their established sober support network. I knew other smartphone apps existed to connect other populations, such as Grindr for gay men, Untapped for beer lovers, and Runkeeper for runners, so I was shocked to find that no similar app existed to connect people in recovery. I immediately recognized how beneficial such an app would be for people in recovery or people still trying to get sober, and I set out to build Sober Grid. I started Sober Grid because I saw an important, but at that time unmet, need for people in recovery from alcohol and drug addiction to find and connect with their peers. I entered recovery at the age of 23, and I've relied on the support I received from sober peers to achieve and maintain my sobriety. Uh, So obviously a truly inspiring, caring individual that is looking to help other people. You guys know that certainly grabs me by the heart. And uh, Forbes even recognized him further. This is a post from SoberGrid.com where he's talking about the fact that he's honored to be selected to join the Forbes Technology Council. He says, it's an amazing opportunity to share what I've learned as an executive and entrepreneur with others. I'm excited to share my experience with leadership, social innovation, and artificial intelligence in the digital health field. By all signs, as of when this stuff is happening, which uh, I think the Forbes article, this is written 2017, uh, seems like his life is on the up and up. Did it stay on that trajectory? Is there something that came into play that leads up to his disappearance? Of course, we're wondering about that as we're looking into this story. And here at a post from Sober Grid themselves, they mention Sober Grid's founder, Bo Mann, has been missing since November 30th. That's 2021. We ask you keep him in your prayers and get the word out for his safe return. Please share this on social media outlets. 
Of course, one of the considerations you would think about is uh, considering that he has struggled with his sobriety in the past, is that a factor in what's going on now? Maybe did he have to put himself into some type of treatment center uh, or care unit or something like that? Typically, those programs run uh, usually from a few weeks to, I think, about 30 days. We're outside of that 30-day window at this point. Uh, so, of, co of course, a big cause for concern. Don't get me wrong. It's pretty clear that his family was already concerned even before that. Um, but it, it seems like that possibility is running thin. And we really need to raise exposure and help get more eyes out there looking for Bo. So let's continue here. Uh, with an article over at losangeles.cbslocal.com. Uh, once again, it's just touching on Sober Grid. Uh, it's been successful in touching thousands of lives across 117 countries because of the team's shared experiences with the community and their clients, said Wendy Warrington, acting CEO of Sober Grid. Now, a member of our team is missing. We're asking our community for help. What's really bizarre about this story? According to the company, Mann texted 911 shortly after leaving a convenience store where he was last seen. What's even stranger than that, the details that I'm seeing as that were released as of just yesterday, um, he might have actually texted 911. And we're, just to be clear, he's texting with the Los Angeles Emergency Department Services. He's texting with them directly. What he says exactly isn't quite out there. But the one thing they're being clear about is he appears to be texting them from an Uber. He's in an Uber at the time that he kicks on this text to 911. What is going on with these details? What was going on uh, with Bo at the time? Let's go ahead and try to dive in further and find out. Uh, first thing, I stopped at NamUs to see if there was a profile. I am not seeing a profile. However, on Web Sleuths, I did see some mention to a profile that might have existed at some point. They had the number for the missing persons case. I put it in here. It's not showing up currently. I don't know why that would happen. Um, although I have to admit, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll do an entry in a name as myself and the profile won't go active for a matter of weeks, sometimes months. There's a process that has to happen where there's a case manager from NamUs that reaches out to law enforcement. They firm up the information. So it's possible the person that made, made the entry didn't realize that there was that process and maybe they started broadcasting the missing person's case ID before the case was actually active. The other possibility is that the case manager reached out to the LAPD and for some reason the LAPD is saying do not show that profile. Uh, I don't believe California is one of the states that has any state laws about NamUs yet. Uh, if you saw the previous episodes we did with Todd Matthews here on the channel last year, you know that he worked very hard to get laws in in several states. Uh, I think at this point there might be around 10 of them that have laws that are promoting really kind of pushing local law enforcement to engage NamUs and have that profile created quickly. Uh, keep in mind, we're also just a little bit over a month outside of when he went missing. So uh, it might be in the works. I'm gonna stay on top of it just to make sure that something does happen. Uh, I will reach out to the case manager for this particular area and ask, is there a profile? If there isn't one, I'm gonna go ahead and generate one myself. But, um, so where can we get the details? Let's get it right from the LAPD. From their uh, Twitter account, at LAPD MPU, the missing persons unit, we can see they've put a poster out here on the disappearance of Bo Mann. Uh, for critical information, um, they've got a few basics, but unfortunately not a whole lot. However, one of the mo most important things is this footage. This is from the day that he disappeared. So this is... Uh, a very strong look at what he was wearing. We've got a blue ball cap. Uh, it looks like a, I think it's a black hoodie that he's wearing, uh, possibly bluish type pants, um, black, black and gray, I would say kind of high tops. We'll get a better description as we go through some of the articles here. What they're saying is uh, man, Bo, the missing person was last contacted via phone on November 28th, 2021 on cell phone. Uh, Bo is described as a 39-year-old male, white, with brown hair, blue eyes, 5'10", around 220 pounds. 
Outside of that, they just have contact information. Of course, we have their phone number on the screen here. We also have more contact information in the description box down below if you happen to have some information on this case. But pretty thin in terms of details on this poster, nothing about the circumstances, where he was last seen, and the information they have, they're going off of phone calls. I believe this was probably with family members on the 28th, but we know that he actually goes missing on the 30th. And that's what's kind of weird about it. This footage of him, this screenshot they got of him from, I don't know, this almost looks like someone's camera in a neighborhood or something. I'm not sure if this is actually from the convenience store. It's possible it is like an outdoor camera from the convenience store, but I don't think so because we're going to see some differences in his attire in another picture from there. Um, just curious, how would you be able to track down this information if you didn't know you were looking for him on November 30th? And if you did have him sighted on these camera shots, why aren't we updating this date here? Um, one of many, many questions in this case. Now, of course, I went looking for media of Bo and, you know, being someone that has started an application like, like he has, uh, there's a few videos that are out there, not a whole lot. There was an interview on this YouTube channel called This Naked Mind, where he was talking about the application, about Sober Grid. Uh, but one of the things that was kind of grabbing me is how different he looks in some photos compared to others. So that's why you might notice uh, right below me, I've actually done things a little differently. Instead of the static picture that I have down there, I'm running a series of different photos of him. And you can see his look kind of changes from each one. Sometimes he has a little more weight on his face. Sometimes he has kind of the goatee growing in, other times completely shaven. And there's one in particular, which I think is kind of important, which is this image, because this is the most recent image that I could find of him. And it's from October 28th, 2021. We're talking just a month after uh, or leading up to his disappearance. So I, I believe this is probably our best look at what his face looks like at this point. Unfortunately, um, he, his look just does change severely. So that's why we're running all these photos that you'll see down below, kind of taking a nod from the Charlie Project and those awesome composites that Megan does of pulling all those different photos together. Uh, we're going to probably start doing this on more videos uh, down below, like we're doing down below right now. Uh, here is another poster. Gives us a little more detail. And finally, we start to understand what convenience store are we talking about? What part of town are we talking about? First thing they note, there is a reward. Uh, in this case, they don't say how much, but I have seen several instances. And of course, in the video that we started this with, uh, we heard Sarah Palin mention the reward as well. Last seen November 30th, uh, 2021 in Los Angeles, California, Studio City area in particular, 39 year old male, Caucasian, 5'11", 220, all pretty much a match from the LAPD's callouts here. Last seen at 2.06 p.m. at 7 in Studio City and texted 911 at 2.15 p.m. Was wearing a blue baseball hat, black hoodie sweatshirt, blue pants, and black sneakers. Had a black backpack, another important thing. And uh, you can see it's it's pretty well loaded. There's There's a lot of stuff in this backpack. Uh, of course, then they just go into contact information, which we already have. Want to give a big thank you to my friends over at the Sky Alert Foundation. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter, you know that I retweet their stuff regularly. Once again, in that same vein, they put together a great composite of kind of different looks of Bo here, along with the critical information needed. Um, but we need some details. Let's get to some news sources over at dailyvoice.com. This is from uh, December 22nd, 2021. Family and friends are pleading for information after a 39-year-old entrepreneur from a New England-based company who has ties to New York went missing in late November. I really wanted to get this sentence in in particular because if he did leave of his own volition, where might he go? Well, his company is running out of Boston in Massachusetts. He's got ties to New York. Uh, his previous work, I believe he was an art dealer uh, in the New York area. Um, he's got family in Massachusetts. He's got family and friends in Texas. So he's living in Los Angeles. Like really, if we put a pinpoint in the map, this, this guy could be anywhere in the US if he is essentially trying to leave 
um, for some reason. But let's continue with the additional details here. He's described as having brown hair, blue eyes, being about five foot ten and two twenty. Uh, his sister Brandy Britnell said, "Man used to live in New York City." Uh, Britnell said she contacted former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin. Of course, we watched that video. Uh, Britnell and Eggers are hoping to see Man's return in time for Christmas. Unfortunately, uh, we know that doesn't happen. We want him back. His friend Eggers said, "We want to know what happened to him." Uh, and I know there's a lot of people very, very concerned now. Hopefully you are now one of those people and we can join together trying to help this family. Please, if you have any friends in any of the areas that we just mentioned, share this video with them. Let's get some eyes, ears, and hearts open and looking for Bo. Continuing at canyonnews.com. Bo was last in contact with family members on November 28th via phone call. Last seen November 30th around 2 p.m. at a convenience store on the 1100 block of Ventura Boulevard. So we know it's a 7-Eleven. We've got an approximate address. We'll take a look at the map in just a moment. Uh, once again, they're just mentioning the clothing description, blue baseball cap, dark sweatshirt, dark pants, black shoes, may also have a large backpack. The, black, the backpack looks black as well. Uh, and here, so we're talking about the corner of Ventura and Vineland. Uh, this is actually an area pretty close to where I used to live. I lived kind of all around the valley, but I lived in Studio City particularly for a little while as well. This is the 7-Eleven at Arch Drive and Ventura Boulevard. Uh, right here. So last scene, there is actually, we're going to look at a photo that's taken from him making a purchase in the 7-Eleven. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to see if I could spot that kind of short wall that we're seeing in the other photos. Maybe over here, this wall over here. Let's take a look at that photo again. Um, I don't know. It looks like it's about the right height, kind of cream colored brick. It might be, but I don't know. The foliage doesn't look quite right. There's there's nothing behind it on this one. I thought maybe. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's quite a match. But uh, knowing this area, one of the important things to point out, look how many businesses line this. Uh, there's homes all around this as well. One of the things we don't really know is where he lives uh, around this. If he's taking an Uber assuming he's going home, which honestly, I don't know if he goes home or not. Uh, I would have to assume that he's probably not within walking distance unless he's taking the Uber because he went to the 7-Eleven and then decided he was going somewhere else from there, uh, which is possible. I mean, we've got, there's, there's apartments literally all around this area, just kind of scattered all around this area. Um, but tons of businesses, which means tons of opportunities for cameras to capture where he's going. Uh, you really, you can't go any direction from that 7-Eleven without being on camera. But we know that he's in an Uber at some point. So once again, that even raises a question for me about where, where is this photo coming from? Is this him on the way to the 7-Eleven possibly? Uh, I'm not sure. Other big question around that is we know that Uber and Lyft, they track their drivers as, as good as technology allows, basically. So once he gets into the Uber, knowing that it is a legit Uber, uh, which is a question, we, we don't know for sure. He thinks he's in an Uber basically when he's communicating with 911. I would like to think that LAPD has already confirmed if it was actually an Uber or not. If they did conf confirm that it was a real Uber, why are we saying that the location he was last seen was 7-Eleven? because the Uber picked him up, took him somewhere else, wherever it dropped him off should be the last location that he was seen, should also push the time frame out a little bit. Uh, another big question, why is he texting with 911 while he's in this Uber? Would the driver have some insight into knowing what's going on with that? Is there someone that's with him uh, outside of the driver? Is there a third party that's part of this? Was there something going on with the driver? Uh, on web sleuths, there's a lot of conversation about, uh, I guess there's an emergency feature that's actually built into Uber. Like if you have a problem with your driver, you just hit this button and it rings you right through to them. Um, 
Was there something like that that was going on? We're not getting any sense of that in terms of information that's coming out through the media. Thankfully, there's a brand new article that came out just yesterday. It's going to give us a lot of additional information, but unfortunately doesn't quite answer those questions. I have one source I found kind of questionable in terms like I don't know where the info is coming from. So I don't know if it's a real answer or if it's just part of rumor mill, but we'll talk about that a little bit too uh, as, as we continue here. So jumping over to globeintel.com. Bo Mann, SoberGrid founder, missing. He was last seen on surveillance at the 7-Eleven store in Studio City at 2.06. The family says he has not made any financial or communications activity whatsoever. Law enforcement is involved and they're working on retrieving more data. Data for someone like this, uh, who by all accounts, his family is very clear. This is a guy that lives on his cell phone. Think about this. He's in what he believes is an emergency situation. And once again, we have no idea what the conditions are around any of this, but he's in what he thinks is an emergency situation and he's texting with 911. Um, so this, this is someone, uh, you know, I imagine his cell phone is really important to him. I think tracking that cell phone, a big part of the investigation around this, uh, would like to hope that all that is, is being worked on. His family and friends say they will offer a reward for any credible information that leads to finding Bo Man dead or alive. Uh, and then there's a quote here from Abigail Anastanzio, who looks like, uh, according to what I could see on Facebook, a friend of Bo's, possibly longtime friend of Bo's, who is now a district judge in Texas. Bo Man is still missing. Last seen November 30th, approximately 2 p.m. at the 7-Eleven in Studio City. He's on surveillance, making a purchase, and then leaves. Around 2.11, he texts 911 and never responds to 911's attempts to reach him. I would think someone with her kind of clout, probably able to reach out to friends in uh, law enforcement, maybe that could open some channels of communication for her with the missing persons unit. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's where additional details are coming in here, or if this is stuff that, you know, Abigail might be in touch with Bo's mother, and this is information being shared from Bo's mother. I, I'm not sure, but we get this additional info here that he texts 911. They attempt to respond to him, but he just doesn't respond back after that. And this is a photo of the surveillance from the inside of the 7-Eleven. You can see this looks like it's in some back room somewhere. They've got, looks like Cat 5 or Cat 6 network cable all coiled up here, uh, a monitor. And he's carrying a drink. Some people are asking, uh, they're debating if it's a Slurpee. It, it might be. I could probably zoom in on it a bit here. Um, but also carrying a bag of items that he's just purchased. There's some information that says he might have bought a bag of ice. Other people are saying, well, they're not really sure of that because the term icy has been used to describe the Slurpee. So maybe that that was miscommunication at some point. Um, I got to tell you guys, the best conversation I'm seeing go on this so far is over at Web Sleuths. And that's a lot of where these kind of back and forths that I'm mentioning are coming from. Um, but notice some differences here. First of all, the uh, hoodie he was wearing looks like it's off. We now see that he's got kind of a bluish aqua t-shirt that he's wearing under that. His hat, the blue hat, not on his head anymore. I mean, he's got this giant backpack, so it could be that he stuffed both those items into the backpack there. Um, kind of interesting that his clothing has changed at that point. Once again, just makes me wonder where, when is this photo from and where, but really when. I have to assume it's from before because the time frame seems so tight. We're talking a matter of minutes. He's in the store making a purchase. And then, I mean, it's less than 10 minutes. He's in this supposedly Uber uh, having the 911 text exchange or non-exchange, just the one message sent to 911 and then him not replying to it. Thankfully, a new article has just come out on January 5th. Very, very big thank you to telegram.com for putting this together, helping this family out in this way. Because honestly, without this article, 
uh, would have been really hard to do coverage of this case. We're going to get answers to a couple questions, a little more insight. The last time Amy Mann saw her son was on a security video as he was walking out of a 7-Eleven in Los Angeles, loaded down with a heavy backpack, a bag of ice, and several other items he had purchased. So there's, sounds like it's a pretty straight up, you know, a bag of ice. I, I, don't, I don't know if there's a, a real misunderstanding potential around that, but there, there's a possibility. Uh, Bowman, 38 years old, they're saying here, most of the other sources are saying 39, had spent Thanksgiving in Texas with his siblings and arrived in LA on November 29th. So he was literally just home for less than a day at this point. His mother said her son's assistant had picked him up and brought him to his apartment from the airport. His homecoming, a quick trip out for what looked like some takeout food and a visit from a friend that evening, were all captured on a security camera, she said. So they've got camera footage, uh, looks like from the night before as well. Um, I don't know if that's from the apartments, possibly, but uh, he goes out, gets some takeout food. He's got a friend that comes over that evening. The next morning, the camera again recorded as he left home on foot and visited a coffee shop. I'm wondering if that's where that picture is coming from because it's saying that uh, he left home on foot. So if we're talking the next morning, unfortunately, he's not giving us a time frame here. Um, that could be several hours before what happens at the 7-Eleven. We've got um, the potential that there's other stops between this coffee shop and what happens at 7-Eleven. But at about 2 p.m., the 7-Eleven camera captured him as he hefted a large backpack off, and the contents, including laptop computers, spilled out. He repacked his bag and left the store at 2.06 p.m. with a large icy fountain drink in one hand and a bulky plastic store bag in the other and a bandana covering the lower part of his face as a mask. It's believed he climbed into either an Uber or a Lyft because less than 10 minutes later, a text came from his cell phone and went to 911. The message indicated he was in an Uber but gave no more information about why he might need help. This is curious because here they're asking, kind of throwing the question. They're not sure if he was in an Uber necessarily or a Lyft. What I believe that's telling me is um, either there hasn't been a clarification, law enforcement hasn't been able to track down this driver for some reason, or law enforcement isn't really speaking to the reporters that are pulling this together hasn't relayed that information to his mother because we know his mother is speaking to the reporters here. Um, as a matter of fact, I think later we see that the reporters reached out to LAPD and didn't get any response. Um, so a little bit of a question here, uh, once again, around this, this Uber. Police reached out to him twice and got no response. His mother said a missing persons report was filed. Uh, she said that she felt put off when police insinuated that her son might have walked away by choice or might be enjoying a digital detox for a period. That's the first time I've ever heard that used in a missing persons case. Maybe, you know, like for law enforcement to suggest to the family, well, maybe, maybe they're doing a digital detox. I don't know. They told me I wouldn't believe how often that happens, she said. But she knows better. If there's anything Bowman would never give up, it's his cell phone, she said. Not to mention, if you're going to do something like that, yeah, I know there's people that do digital detox. Uh, they want to, you know, improve their mental health. They'll put their phone away, not access it, sometimes for a day. Sometimes they'll do it for a weekend. I know there's got to be people out there that have done it for a week, something along those lines. Doesn't mean that you cut off your family uh, don't tell anyone that you're doing this. We can tell just from the articles we've been looking at, we've got a friend of his, we've got his sister. Uh, I can tell you his brother is active on online, raising awareness to this. Um, other family members, we know someone is paying for all these cameos with uh, Sarah Palin and uh, Chris Hansen. There's also another one with a guy from Ink Master. Um, I, I just, I don't think that that is an accurate understanding really, of what a digital detox is. It'd be different if these were social media friends that were trying to get a missing persons case opened with LAPD. And LAPD is like, hey, your friend user 2098 
Um, maybe they're, they're just going through a digital detox. Like that might be understandable, like as a, as a reasonable excuse to a family member that had just spelt, spent time with him during a holiday. And, you know, they're checking in to make sure he gets home. Okay. And it seems like he's home. Okay. But then the next day he's just gone. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. Kind of makes you shake your head sometimes when you hear some of this stuff. A uh, man said that she's not naive and realizes that her son could have relapsed or perhaps suffered a mental health crisis. I do want to stop here for a moment. Of course, we've talked about it on the channel here enough, and I know that you're a community that understands this uh, about me in particular. I don't run away from cases where I think that that's a possibility. Um, because I believe that we need to care about everyone. And outside of caring about everyone, there's a family that is hurt in all this. There's a, a the ripple effect of who's affected in a disappearance like this is huge. And I know some people get very angry thinking about um, the fact that someone might not be strong enough to face their addictions. And some people look for a place to put the blame so that they can take what I call emotional off ramps and decide that they're not going to care about a particular case because it involves a person that's make in their mind, making a choice. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of people out there that have experience and know well enough that this is not a choice. This is something that is literally a disease. There are uh, physiological things at play, sometimes psychological things at play that are, are bigger than making it just a simple choice like that. But, uh, I do want to call out when I see warning indicators of that, because I do believe that it also shifts where people should be trying to help. Uh, we're trying to raise awareness to this. We're trying to be as fair as we can with the information. I'm trying to present the best information I can to you guys. And sometimes that includes observations. Those two YouTube videos strike me as someone that might still be struggling with addiction issues, not someone that has completely been able to, to battle that demon or, or however you want to phrase it. Uh, in particular, it really struck me because if you watch those two videos, uh, it almost seems like two very different people. In one of them, he's extremely lethargic to the point where I'm wondering if he's going to stay awake for the actual interview. In the next one, he seems to have lost a considerable amount of weight. Now we are talking a few years later, um, but he's speaking so fast. I literally had to play it back at 75% speed just to understand what he was saying in his YouTube intro that he's doing for this new YouTube page that he's put, put together. It looks like in October, he was trying to put together some type of new social media presence. There's a blog, there's uh, the corresponding YouTube page that's attached to the blog. We're going to look into the blog just a little bit. I'm not really looking into it for those types of indicators. I'm looking more for insight in terms of what Bo might have been going through in that month leading up to his disappearance. Uh, but I can tell you other people are, are reading through that blog uh, and they're also concerned that there might be some substances or a mental health crisis of some kind that are at play. So, uh, his mother being open about this, honest about this, um, but also with a very big reason to be concerned. Uh, I just, I just want to echo. Absolutely. It could be a factor in this. And if it is a factor in this, things like the laptops, become somewhat important. Uh, who carries around multiple laptops in their backpack? Yes, he's a CEO for a tech company for an app, essentially. Um, but I used to work in technology myself. There was never, ever a reason I would have to carry more than one laptop. Even now in terms of doing, uh, I don't do a whole lot of it, but I have done some remote production. I get everything boiled down to one unit. So what I'm concerned about is the possibility that if there is substances at play in this disappearance, uh, were the laptops something that he was looking, was he going to go to a pawn shop to try to get some cash? Was he going to try to use those as some form of payment? 
uh, if substances are at play? Was there a debt that he had been accumulating that is now some aspect of this disappearance as well? There's a lot of things like that that start to, you have to throw them on the scales um, in, in a disappearance of, of this nature. But back to his mother's point, those things would not have kept him from at least calling home on Christmas. And after reading through, I'll, I'll be sharing it with you guys, but after reading through, he's pretty clear that, you know, um, his path to sobriety hasn't been a straight line and, and hasn't been perfect. So I do believe his family has probably experienced him in times where um, he might have, have struggled with relapses. And his mother's kind of being clear about it here. He, he would still call home for Christmas. He would still want to talk with his siblings' children. Uh, and I got to tell you, the photos that I'm seeing on the Facebook pro profiles around the family, this guy loves, loves the kids in his family. So um, I don't know, but let's continue. There was no word from him on Christmas. Instead, there were hastily bought gifts and no Christmas tree as the family worked to find Bo, she said. Bo's siblings and parents have been out to California. They got their boots on the ground. They went around trying to find him, putting up posters, of course, asking for police to do more. Um, I, I just, it's really tough for me because I got to tell you guys, when I cover cases that involve uh, LAPD, I just, I hear about this time and time again, just very hard to get responsiveness from them. I know they're dealing with a huge city, um, millions of people that live in that area. I can't imagine it's an easy job, but connectivity with LAPD can sometimes be tough. I could tell you guys still after six or seven years of doing this, I've given up on trying to uh, process FOIAs with LAPD. They just, they don't respond at all. The process for even requesting a Freedom of Information Act request is literally completely broken. Like there's one phone number that you call that is li literally just a busy signal 90% of the time. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I understand it's, it's, it's just a different, it's a different type of area. So of course it's got to have different type of policing, but man, I just, I wish we could get better connectivity for these families. Uh, hopefully they're talking to the investigator, but quite honestly, I, I don't ha really have any good sense of that here. Um, so his mother wanted to go back out there, but my husband has to work and he won't let me go back alone. So she sits at her computer. She stares at the videos and works the phones, hoping that she'll run across someone who knows something. One thing she recalled was that Bo was planning to meet up with a man he had become acquainted with recently. That man is Blake Brown. Brown said in a telephone interview that he had done some work for Bo and stayed in his apartment sometime around August. He said the two were not dating, but were friends with benefits. Um, and his mom also mentions here that Bo had recently come out of a more serious relationship. I think he was actually engaged in that relationship based on some of the analysis that I'm seeing on web sleuths. Uh, so it seems like that was now in the past, Bo kind of moving into the future might have struck up a little something with this person, uh, Blake Brown. But Brown says he hasn't heard from man since about the time that he seemingly disappeared. I'm hoping that he's just walking around crazy, he said. Kind of a strange statement. But he says that the situation is seriously strange. It frightens him and he wonders if man had a secret that no one knew about. Brown said the police have not spoken with him, which is kind of interesting. Like, uh, you know, this guy communicated with him. Basically, when Bo was coming back to L.A., he was kind of texting with Brown saying, hey, I, I want to see you. And uh, effectively, Brown was in Las Vegas at the time. He's like, I, I can't. So we know there's some communication that's going on between these two guys leading right up into his disappearance. He's only home for a matter of hours not even a full day before he disappears. But uh, for some reason, LAPD has not reached out to speak to Brown. And then here's the note. LAPD did not return a call from a reporter seeking information on the case. Like, do we have public information officers in the LAPD? Like that, that for an area that large, that should be 
an absolute must. Amy Mann said she believes someone may have harmed her son, though she can't imagine why. She said he only just started taking a salary from the company, and if someone harmed him for money, they'd likely not get much. That's another little indicator for me, just has me concerned about this thing with the laptops. Is he using that to, to try to, to get some cash? Maybe she thought someone saw the computers fall from his bag and wanted them. She runs through theories, some plausible, like maybe he was hurt by one of the drivers in the rideshare vehicle. He could have been dating someone she didn't know, or perhaps there was a problem at work. Uh, one thing that the web sleuths noticed is that the social account, I believe, on Facebook for his company did not mention his disappearance at all. Kind of strange that they wouldn't fire up everything they could in terms of social networking on that. But whatever has happened, man's family wants answers. So uh, I told you guys there's this other information. I, I can't really rely on it because I don't know the source. Uh, and I'm, you know, to see an article like this relatively, I mean, not relatively, very well put together, you can tell that they were chasing the leads down, trying to do the research to put out the best information they could about Bo's disappearance. They didn't come up with this little factoid. So it's just, it's got me kind of questioning it. Um, but we have another missing poster for him here. Um, they're noting the photo with the actual clothes he was wearing, but they give a little bit of a different description and additional detail here that I'm just not finding anywhere else. So please take this with a grain of salt. I don't know how valid it is necessarily, but uh, they're kind of reciting the same thing. He's at the 7-Eleven at uh, 11007 Ventura Boulevard on November 30th. He's last seen on video. He bought a few items. Then he was seen in an Uber vehicle. Within minutes of entering the Uber at the 7-Eleven, a text was made from Bo's phone to 911. The Uber driver states that Bo was dropped off at the apartment in Los Angeles. Um, where is this information coming from? I don't know. If there's any friends or family that are seeing this video, uh, if you guys have more information about this, please let us know in the comments. I'll pin it to the top of the comments. This seems extremely important. Has someone talked? First of all, has it been identified that it is a legit Uber? Second, has someone spoken to this actual driver? And then third, if he did say that, does he mean Bo's apartment? Or is he talking about some other apartment building in Los Angeles, of which there are many? If he does mean Bo's apartment, I think they should at least get the street name out so that we kind of have a better localized area of where he was last seen. But also, if they do mean that the Uber driver did actually take Bo back to his apartment, that just opens the door for like, I mean, what happens from there? Like, he could have gone back into the apartment. He could have slept the day away. He could have gone out the next morning and then something happened. But but the thing is, it sounds like they've got cameras at the apartment um, based off what his mother was saying in that last article. So if you have the Uber driver drop him off at the apartment, they should be able to pick that up on those cameras and say, oh yeah, he did show back up, but he didn't come into the apartment. He walked down the street or, or whatever happened from there. Um, so really, this case in my mind has a big problem with the last point that he was actually seen. Because if it is a legit Uber, there's more information. If the driver dropped him off somewhere, there's a completely different location and time. And then there's the question of what happened in the car to make him text 911. Um, I don't know. I don't know. So I mentioned it looks like he was kind of gearing up a new social media presence. Uh, this is the bowman.com and it looks like it was a blog that he was going to put together uh, and I just wanted to share this with you guys a little bit um, he says it pretty plainly here this website is about me bowman a person who I respect and admire and want to share with you why do this blog it's a surprise given all the reasons I didn't want to do this blog you don't like writing 
you're ashamed about some parts of who Bowman is and have tried to stay non-public to avoid having to address the parts that I was ashamed of. Now, you'd be faced with having to publicly disclose info that you may not want to, info that could damage your reputation or the view people have on you. So again, why? What if I can change a kid's life who may have started to go down the wrong path as I did? Perhaps the young man has been in the various unfortunate spots that I was in during my late teens, such as being insecure and having little to no self-esteem, using alcohol and drugs, hiding from who I was. Or maybe he too is hanging out with the wrong friends during a very impressionable and defining young age. It's not because I'm wanting to get clicks or likes. It's because I get my validation from being home at night And as I fight the self-talk, berating myself for being addicted and it being too powerful of a chemical brain-controlling storm for me to get over it and stay over it forever thus far, I often feel like I'm a loser and I hate myself. But with the work I do, like writing this blog, speaking openly in the media or sober grid, gives me ammunition to fight back against the negative self-talk. I'm a person who understands that it is an illness. And rather than judge others, I stand up to help them. I fight back on the stigma. I try to help others when and however I can. I am indeed a good person. So, F you voice that says, Bo, Bo, how could you do this again? You drug addict, loser, loser, loser. You freaking keep relapsing like too many times, dude. So, if there is someone wanting a lesson out there, here's my first lesson. Don't get followers to feel cool, liked, and loved. Be able to love yourself. Help someone to be cool, liked, loved, and feel self-respect. I got to tell you, there's a lot of that that certainly speaks to me directly. Um, And... It's interesting because in some way you can tell that he's writing, he's writing to himself. I mean, even, even the tense is kind of slipping back and forth. Um, but he's also being very open about the fact that it has been an ongoing struggle and maybe the shiny image and the nice story that you would hear in a publication like Forbes or something like that isn't really getting to the gritty reality of what it's like to, to deal with addictions of this nature. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you guys. I think Bo has a lot to say that would be helpful to a lot of other people. I'm hopeful that Bo is out there. Uh, I'm hopeful his family finds him, brings him home, gives him all the resources he needs to continue fighting that good fight because it sounds like there's a pretty awesome guy out there waiting to be found. It looks like his family has started a Facebook page dedicated to this instance. It's called find Bowman. Uh, it doesn't have a ton of support right now, guys. So if you could take a moment, if you've been moved by hearing Bo's story, hearing his own words, uh, please take a moment, come here, show your support, let them know that, um, They've got more people on their side that are trying to help find Bo with them as well. I would really, really appreciate that. If you do want to get in on the conversation, of course, the comments down below are going to be a great place, but Web Sleuths has a very good thread that's been going on this as well. I just wanted to call out this one post by Azure. I hope that if Bo has relapsed and is feeling ashamed, he knows that no one that matters will judge him. I'm certain that his friends only want to find him safe and that no matter what has happened, he's a valuable person who deserves support and love. And from Bo's Facebook page from June 3rd, 2018, don't hate the addict, hate the disease. Don't hate the person, hate the behavior. If it's hard to watch it, imagine how hard it must be to live it. I would like to turn a few of those don't hates into love, love the addict, love the person. I hope you guys do too.
that's it for today's searchlight. Thank you guys so much. Um, I really hope we see a good outcome on this case. And uh, for any of his family out there, just know that uh, you, you've got more supporters now. And whatever the next step is, please feel free to let me know. We're going to help in any way that we can. Um, to do that, I have to thank the people that help keep us going here. A big thank you to new patrons, Jeanette Newell, Sabrina, and Tammy. Uh, also, Sabrina decided to increase her pledge after she joined. I really appreciate that, Sabrina. Thank you so much. Uh, we do these presentations with extremely limited commercials, sometimes no commercials at all. We can't do that without the amazing support of so many of you viewers out there. If you want to help support the channel, visit lordandarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Haley recently did. We really appreciate your support as we try to help these families in these tough, tough situations. Take care, everyone. Have a nice weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked on the Lord and Arts channel.